So I want to take a minute to thank our sponsors again. Um, we've got a bunch of really great sponsors who have been with us through this wild ride to a virtual conference. At the diamond level, we have Warner Media. Gold level, we have Kennesaw State University, Coles College, and the KSU Department of Information Systems. Bishop Fox, Coal Fire, Genuine Parts Company, and NCR. Crystal level is Critical Path and Synopsis. Silver level is Aaron's, Binary Defense. Black Hills, Core Light, and Guide Point Security. Bronze level is NCC Group. Our in-kind sponsors are EC Council for online training and Secure Code Warrior for the virtual CTF. We'd also like to thank uh, Crosshair Information Technology, Joe Gray, Offensive Security, and Pentester Lab for contributions to the raffle prizes. Um, and uh, if you haven't joined the raffle, we have a few more really great prizes coming up. So join the uh, raffle giveaways channel and make sure to fill out the form to get signed up for the, the raffle. Um, also make sure to drop your pin on our map so we can see where everybody is coming from. I'll post a link in the uh, Track Protect channel right now. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, that's where all of these talks are going to be posted. Uh, so you can watch them later and catch the talks that you missed on the other tracks. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand this over to Carlota, uh, who will be taking it from here. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Let me see if I can share. Oh, come on, share. All right. Hello, let me see. Come on, share. Technology, all right. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Patrick, and to all of the sponsors, I really appreciate it. A uh, big shout out to the organizers. You guys did a, an amazing, guys and ladies, ladies and gentlemen, did an amazing job pulling this together as a virtual uh, piece. And I, I really appreciate the, the level of professionalism and communication. So thank you also for inviting me to talk about low tech and insecure, building healthy boundaries and defeating imposter syndrome, hopefully. Um, this is not a technical talk. This is a talk about being a human in tech. That is something I've had 20 plus years of experience with. Um, and I want to set a couple of expectations here. Whenever I have, I've been submitting this talk to B-sides, different B-sides all over the country for about a year now. And I get two pieces of feedback. One piece of feedback is, this is an HR talk. It doesn't belong at a B-sides. And the other piece of feedback I get is, uh, imposter syndrome isn't a real thing. So I want to address those in case those are already in your mind. This is not an HR talk. <laughs> HR, it's, it's probably a good thing I own my own company right now, because uh, I don't think that HR would really like what I'm about to say. Uh, number two, imposter syndrome, whether that is real or not, I am not going to wait for the American Medical Association or for uh, the mentalhealth.gov folks to declare that an actual um, issue or, or label it a, a mental health issue. Uh, people who are ex experiencing this anxiety feel like imposter syndrome describes their experience very well, and I'm going to not be dismissive of that experience for them. I do not have that experience. I am very fortunate in that regard. So let me tell you a little bit about why I feel like I don't have that. Um, I am Carlota Sage. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter. I've worked at a lot of big companies in, in tech in Silicon Valley mostly in IT and support operations. I ended up on a six-week contract in 2013 at a little company called FireEye that went from 300 people when I started in April to, uh, to almost 1,200 people, including contractors, by December of that year. So that was a wild ride. I ended up uh, taking a role, uh, a long-term role with them. And four and a half years later when I left, I was like, wow, that was amazing. Um, I really loved the company, but more than that, I really loved this industry and what information security and, and cybersecurity are trying to do. Um, from that perspective, it's easy to look at my career and say I've been very successful. Now, there have been a lot of failures that have gone into that success, and some of those were educational failures. I dropped out of Auburn before I could fail out. Uh, I started back to school at Durham Tech 
shout out to our community colleges. And I did finally graduate with a bachelor's degree in textile chemistry of all things from NC State. So shout out to our public schools. And then I did a master's at an Ivy League university, which was essentially, fortunately for me, out of pocket from all of my Netflix stock when I went to work there. Now I'm broke. So, uh, but I, I tell you these things to give you context of my path into security and through technology as a human being and as a woman has been very diverse. It's been all over the place. Um, and I don't want anyone to be discouraged. Uh, if you have career concerns, I am always happy to help or listen to you talk about those things. But let's get on talking about being low tech and insecure. <laughs> Boundaries for me are what I feel like really defined and, and helped me be successful or more successful as I've grown older um, in technology and infosec. We don't all start out this amazing human being who's full of confidence, who knows what they're doing. And, and we look at other people and when we see that and try to compare ourselves to that, that's a really unfair comparison. We don't all start out with mentally healthy families who are supportive of our decisions. We don't start in the right body sometime. There's a lot of pieces that go into this that when you're looking from the outside at somebody, you're not seeing their evolution through through into their success or into their personhood so part of it for me um is just helping people who either don't come from that healthy background find that healthy level playing field and also helping people who do come from that healthy background understand you know bridge that gap how can you help it, folks who need uh, a little more coaching on the emotional or the human side. Um, I think it's incredibly important as technologists, we wanna solve everything with a widget or an application or a platform, but the pieces that we're securing, the data that we secure, it's created by humans, it's acted on by humans, it's stolen by humans, right? This is a human problem. We are, we are in a technology field that solves human problems. And that's the piece that I, I feel like gets lost in translation sometimes. Uh, I love that I'm seeing more and more B-sides and other uh, regional conferences focus more on the human piece. I think it's very important. I don't think you can be as successful as you could be in technology if you walk away from that human piece. I'm going to start with some physical boundaries. Uh, the Me Too movement, you hear from a lot of folks. Um, I'm not sure what I can and can't do. I think coronavirus right now, COVID-19, and the shelter in place is going to change how we think about our physical boundaries. So this slide may get updated in the next few weeks. And that how you impact other people's space is very important. When you're very tall or very broad, or physically big person who takes up a lot of space. Um, you want to be a little bit further back from people, right? When, when you close in on them, we as humans, we as animals fundamentally, find that to be a very aggressive move and we're going to move back. Uh, in terms of touching, it becomes, it, that's a very cultural piece almost. There's a lot of pieces around where can I touch somebody, how long, a very brief touch is acceptable. Um, touching on the arms is usually acceptable. Historically, shoulders have been acceptable. I think they're moving maybe more, more towards a maybe, uh, but touching the front of anyone, torso, male or female, or unidentified, that's just not acceptable. Never, you should never be touching somebody's body, um, torso, breast, chest, uh, upper thighs, unless you know them and have consent, right? Um, when you're taking pictures, if you look at the back side on the right, there is a little sliver of maybe if you're taking pictures and you're sliding your arm around somebody to gather people in for a picture, that's acceptable. That's a context uh, specific incident, right? Or context specific um, moment. But your hand should stay up. It should not slide down to the hip. It should definitely not slide down to the rear. These, these are very common sense pieces. Uh, most people know this, but not everyone does, uh, especially if you come from a very touchy-feely family and you're surrounded by people who aren't as comfortable being touched. 
um, it, it's easy for misinterpretation or, or discomfort to be generated if you're much more physical. And I tend to be a very huggy physical person. And I've had to learn over the years to kind of pull back, make sure when I go to see somebody I haven't seen in a long time, are you a hugger or a handshaker? Um, Asking is never a bad idea. People usually really appreciate it, especially when you're dealing with a lot of introverts who aren't getting out, especially right now, right? Um, who aren't getting out and they're not seeing people. Understanding physical boundaries becomes um, very important. And if you're not sure, it's totally fine to ask. I don't think um, anyone should ridicule you for asking. And if they do, that's, I want you to remember that's on them and not on you you are right to ask where those boundaries are. Uh, verbal boundaries, <laughs> words can kill. And, and I mean that both literally, we see a lot of cases where bullying has led to a suicide. Um, families are pursuing that, um, pr prosecutors are pursuing that. But more importantly, in, in an even more broad context, the words that you choose can kill morale, they can kill your credibility. Uh, the tone that you use, and it, and this is a tough one because there are people who have very flat affects and very flat tones. You need to give, you need to give people room for cultural differences, for saying, you know, English is a second language. It's important that we let people fail a little and then offer to help them if, if needed. If you have a very flat aff affectation and that's a part of who you are and there's not a lot that you can do about that, it doesn't hurt to say, I know that this sounds very flat because this is how I am. Let me give you a little more context. People are going to be much more forgiving if you can try to bridge that gap up front, right? So I, I know that we don't have a lot of time together and there are probably gonna be some questions about this. So I'm gonna hold questions off to the end. If you have uh, in the workplace, we get very comfortable with each other. We like to talk smack. We like to put each other down sometimes. And we can get, some of us can get very aggressive with that if we're very comfortable with it. But you have to be very aware of the people around you and how they interpret that. Give people an opt out, right? If, if you're very casual and comfortable talking about terrible things in the office and somebody says, hey guys, could you not? Ladies, could you not? Could you take it somewhere else? Be respectful and, and thank them excuse yourselves to another room and have that conversation somewhere else. We're in a profession where um, there's a lot of pressure on us and <laughs> especially anyone who is involved in defending human lives. And one of those outlets that we have is to express things in very horrible and socially unacceptable ways, um, which can be very funny, but don't necessarily belong somewhere where other people can hear it. <laughs> so, be aware of your situation, be aware of your surroundings, be aware of how you look to other people. You don't wanna kill your credibility because you're trying to blow off some steam. So I would very much caution around, um, there's a lot that you can do around training for this. And there's also a lot that you can do to step in. If you feel like somebody is being verbally aggressive and, and in a not good way, it's okay to step in. Absolutely, or if they've said something really, truly horrible, um, and, and I, I don't wanna give examples right now <laughs> because I've heard some really terrible things, but I'll give you an example of how I respond to those things. And one of the responses I use is, I want you to hold that thought because I want you to think about what you've said and reflect on it later. But I want you to take this moment right now and say anything else, just say anything else, right? And, and that kind of puts people on alert that they have said something egregiously wrong uh, and gives them a chance to self-correct. And uh, that's worked very well for me and in the organizations I've worked in. Uh, you may need to sit down, if you are a hiring manager especially or, or a leader in your organization, it does not hurt to sit down and pattern out it and actually write down an etiquette, an etiquette that you expect people to follow. Because fundamentally, we still have to work together and we want to be respectful of each other in the best way possible, right? So uh, if you have situations where people have said something to you or about you that you weren't sure how to respond, throw those in the, in the Slack channel and we'll talk about those. I would love to, to get some examples and see how people have handled different things. And maybe we can build a, a kind of a pool of experience that people can share. Uh, emotional 
that is one of the biggest gray areas because we as human beings, the first 20 years of our lives wire us in very wildly different ways. And uh, our emotional response may or may not be appropriate to certain situations. What I really like people to remember is that your, your boundaries, anything that makes you uncomfortable has pushed on a boundary. And that boundary may be perfectly reasonable or it may not. Your boundaries are your own. Other people don't have to understand them or agree with them, but hopefully they do respect them. If you are terrified of dogs, your friend bringing a dog around is not gonna make you not terrified of dogs. And it's, it's a little disrespectful of your phobia. Right? Dogs are great. I love dogs. They're fantastic. But if you don't like dogs, if you had a traumatic experience with a dog in your, in your past, my bringing a dog around is not going to solve that. It's not going to diffuse that. It's going to push that and it's going to make you upset. Um, be more aware if you can. When people say, oh, I have a phobia about that, or no, I'm really scared of that, um, or people just react very defensively to something that's going on, see if you can break that down with them. And if you can understand what's going on, maybe you can work around it. Your boundaries are also flexible. Um, you may be more forgiving of being touched or being pushed verbally um, by others in a given situation, but not by, but not by a certain group, right? That's up to you. That's up to you. And, and you need to be very clear on why you're more flexible with some people than others. Maybe you just trust them more. But mostly your boundaries, whatever you develop from an emotional standpoint, they should help you navigate the world and the personal interactions that you have with confidence. If your boundaries are too restrictive, you're going to have trouble with that. And there's a give and take there. It could be that you just accept that as part of who you are. It could be that you find a therapist who works with you through those, those problems. If you were madly in love with someone and they have a dog and you're, you have a dog phobia, you're gonna have to figure out where that boundary is and how you want to work around it. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have any easy answers here. Um, as I said, a lot of us don't come from a, a emotionally stable, supportive home. And so this piece becomes very critical in learning how you're reacting to your workplace and to the people you work with and the trust and the relationships that you build. If you have um, and right now, especially with most of us working from home, this becomes very, very stressed because you are now, even if you work from home all the time, now your roommate or your spouse or your kids are home all the time as well. And that changes your dynamic very, very much. And that puts a lot of pressure on your emotional boundaries. So I would really encourage you, if you're struggling right now, don't beat yourself up about it. Um, things are crazy right now. Your life has been very much impacted by something that you have zero control over. And that's, uh, that's very stressful, whether or not you've been working from home for years. So, but if you have questions that you think I can help you with, take them to the channel and we'll, we'll go to them there. Now I'm going to get to the stuff that HR really doesn't like to talk about. <laughs> and that's sexuality, sexuality in the workplace, in the industry, at conferences, um, it happens, right? We're, we are fundamentally animals. We have attraction, we have both emotional attraction, we have physical attraction. My biggest and simplest advice is when it comes to sexuality in the workplace and relationships in the workplace, taking them beyond a coworker environment, don't do it. Just don't do it. It's, it's just a bad idea. And I have seen it work out very well for people. I have seen it go very badly as well. Um, I have seen people quit jobs and leave industries over it. It is, it is a tough line to walk. Um, if you are spending a lot of time with someone though, you do, you, you're spending eight hours, 10 hours a day sometimes working with that person and you're creating those bonds, maybe you're responding to that. You also have to remember that maybe they're not responding to it. Uh, the best thing that you can do is be extremely clear in your communication. If you think there is no hope 
that this person already has a committed relationship, don't just don't even go there. Just drop it. It hurts. It sucks to work around. Uh, but you do, you get over it eventually. I promise, I promise. <laughs> I have been in this situation. I've been the target of this situation. Um, it is, it's tough. I, I won't lie. It will stretch your, your boundaries. You'll learn, you'll learn to grow. Uh, the other piece of this though is even if you do start a relationship, it can get very dicey because if people don't know that you're in a relationship and they see you getting a little bit more cozy, um, that can raise questions of your credibility and, and that becomes a risk for, for you and for your career. If that person is already in a relationship, even if that relationship is an open relationship and your relationship is consensual, not everyone in the office may know that, right? If, if you are going to do an office romance, take it out of the office and be very clear upfront if this seems to be working out, you know, does, does one of us need to leave the company? Does one of us need to leave the organization? Uh, I have seen it where, and of course, some of the really large companies, um, I believe, in Silicon Valley have dating services so they can match their own employees up. If you're working in totally different places, that is not a problem. But if you're in a smaller organization, that it becomes a huge problem. And you need to be very aware of that before you make any move on anyone. But for the most part, just don't. <laughs> That's my best advice. Um, I have had workplace relationships. There are people that I would, would work with again in a heartbeat with the understanding that that was the past and it will never happen again. And I know that they know that and I know that and we can work together fine. I've had workplace relationship where, um, where that's not the case. So it can be very dicey. If you are in this situation and you're looking for some guidance, I'm happy to talk to you about that. Um, but more importantly, there, there are other pieces here that <laughs> um, I'm just going to jump to it. Should I send this person a dick pic? Like if you're on that point, like I'm really into this person, you know, male or female, whoever your, your target is, um, really, did they specifically ask for that? Because if they didn't, don't do it. Just under, just don't do it. It's a bad idea. Uh, if they specifically ask for it, that's a different thing. And, and what I don't go into here is also, there are, there are so many topics that we can talk about here. Revenge porn, if you are surfing the net and you come across porn of a coworker, um, that puts you in a very interesting place. Because if you tell that person that you have found porn of them, did they already know? Is this going to be crushing? Are they, are you putting them in a, in a very emotionally vulnerable place? Um, for the most part, I would try to be very circumspect about that. Uh, it's unfortunate, an unfortunate truth in our industry. We're very familiar. There are a lot of women uh, in our industry or in, and in tech in general, in the world in general, who've been victims of revenge porn. Um, and it's a very sensitive subject how you would approach somebody about that, I would be very careful. I would not, uh, I would certainly not send that link around and say, hey, is this so-and-so? That is not okay. If you think it's so-and-so, make the assumption that it is, delete it from your hard drive, never look at it again, and make, if you think they don't know what's out there and, and you think they trust you enough and you're willing to help them in whatever way you can, maybe approach it, but if it's not someone that you know well, uh, you may do more damage than good. And that's something that you'll want to consider. Um, and in terms of sending images of yourself, whether you're male or female, if they have not been requested, don't do it. Because it's, it's a very dicey thing that, you, that you're, really, you're really putting your credibility out there in some potentially very negative ways, right? So uh, I know I've kind of stepped through very quickly a lot of things about pushing boundaries. And, but I want, I want to get, uh, spend a little more time around the concept of, of boundaries and ab abuse. Um, pushing boundaries can be a good thing. They take you out of your comfort zone. They give you a chance to grow. Um, but if somebody's pushing your boundaries repeatedly to the point where you ask them to stop, that's a problem. Uh, and you see that a lot with more kind of verbal abuse of a more, um, uh, less so in the workplace with physical abuse, although I have, I have seen, witnessed that as well. Uh, 
But if, if you are to the point where you've asked somebody to stop, that's that you're getting in some, some gray, well, very yellow, orange areas. And if they continue doing it after you've stopped, ask them to stop, especially if you ask them repeatedly to stop. Now, now we're getting into abuse territory. Obviously, anything that is illegal, a sexual or physical assault, that's obviously abuse. You know, call the police. But in the workplace, that can be harder. You know, it's a lot harder to recognize abuse, especially if you either came from an abusive family, so this looks like normal kind of behavior to you, and it's really not acceptable, or you come from a normal family, and you've never encountered this before. Sometimes it can be very, very subtle. Um, excessive negativity, belittling, nothing you do is good enough. Uh, the obvious ones, of course, yelling, um, name calling, that kind of thing. But those are very obvious. It can be very subtle. Gaslighting is a term that we use a lot in relationships. It comes from an old movie, I think in the 1940s or 50s, where basically um, they're turning lights and on and off and, and telling this woman she's crazy when in reality they're trying to drive her crazy. Um, it can be that malicious. A lot of that is about control and the desire for control. If you are, if you are questioning whether or not your boss is abusive, I would definitely seek a third party um, to bounce some ideas off of because it can be, it can be tough to see it. It can be very tough to see it, making you feel like nothing you ever do at work is is good enough is a big red flag to me. Um, it at moving goals. Like, oh, if you do this project, then I'll, I'll give you this title. Um, oh, well, you didn't do that project as well as I thought you would, but they don't have any constructive feedback, but the goal was moved. That's, that's pretty shady. Um, being in a work environment can be very emotionally devastating with the wrong boss. And if you're a new, if you're new to the work field, you don't necessarily know what a good boss versus a bad boss looks like. If you're not sure, go and ask someone. Come, you know, hit me in Twitter. I'll give you my phone number. We'll talk about it. Uh, there, there are times when it really is clear that that your boss is just emotionally not healthy, and they're creating a very toxic environment for you to live in and work in. And there's only so many things that you can do there. Um, HR usually is invested in not rocking the boat. They don't want your complaints because now they have to do something about them. And because you're the low person on the totem pole or you're not the director or whatever you know, they have invested in, um, sometimes that solution is to make you go away. Uh, and that's not pretty, but that is a reality of corporate America that I want you to be aware of. Uh, HR is not your friend. HR is there to cover the company. As long as keeping you happy does serves the company, they're going to keep you happy. But when your situation becomes a risk, you are just as likely to be the person to go or more likely to be the person to go, especially if there's a power imbalance. If it's a director or a manager, it's a problem. Right, and, and you're the easier problem to solve. Sweeping the problem under the rug is usually easier to solve. So be very careful when you're, when you're traversing this route on how you handle those discussions with HR. If it's anything that can be absolutely recorded and is, you know, and acted on legally, then you need to record it, act on legally, not through your HR department. You need to engage outside counsel or go ahead and call the police um, and do it that way. Because a lot of times I, I knew um, a woman who came from a large corporation that had essentially a whisper network where one director in particular would hit his coworkers or his, his peers and other groups at conferences with a date rape drug. And that company had probably 10 or 12 complaints about that person and he was never, it was always easier to sweep it under the rug for them. So I want you to be very aware. If you are at an industry conference, even with your own team, keep an eye out for each other. It's super important that we be as ethical as possible in our industry, and there are people who abuse that. Um, and I can't, I can't underscore the seriousness of that enough.
So I know that we don't have a lot of time together and, and this is a, I got into some pretty heavy stuff pretty quick. Um, and we're coming up on, on two minutes before I need to hand this over. So I wanna give you some resources. If you feel like you have grown up in an abusive or traumatic environment, if you have been um, incredibly depressed and are feeling suicidal, if you have been sexually assaulted, there are a lot of resources out there. Um, please never be afraid to ask for help. Whether it's a small thing and saying to a, a coworker, I'm really drowning right now. Can you help me out and just take a little load off of me? And being willing to step, in, step up and do the same when they're drowning. Um, or if it's something much more serious, please reach out for help. I, can't, I cannot express that enough. For me, learning to ask for help was the biggest piece of making this um, all, all possible. So with that, I know we're reaching 30 minutes. Um, I am Carlotta Sage, I'm a human in tech. I hope that you have found this helpful. I hope that uh, you hit me with some experiences of your own so that we can all grow and learn from them. And I'm going to give this back to Patrick. Thanks guys and gals, thanks folks.